Hi, Larry. Mr. President. How are you? Well, sir, are you? Pretty good. I'm already wired up here, so okay. you all can get wired. Hello, Hi. You know these are for you as yes. much as for us. Now I have to... Yeah, there. I got myself tangled up. You all walked away. I... <laughs> we leave you here by yourself? Huh? Can we leave you here yeah. by yourself? These are, in case you have any problems, as you know, like, right, you. available. Well, and uh, as you know, sir, this is going to be for the Monday magazine, which will have mm -hmm. a large story on uh, your new campaign. Yeah. Well, let me, because I'm, uh, I wish it were Monday instead, so that we're doing this right. I know the type of things you want to ask, and let me just say to you, uh, I'm, you're going to ask the questions on the assumption that I am, so I will answer uh, uh, in the context of your assumption. Okay. But I am not going to say those magic words one way or the other. Okay, fair enough. Well, then, I will slightly reword this first question. Impossible. The first question was uh, when you decided to run and whether you uh, consulted with many advisors and friends or was it just with Mrs. Reagan? Well, I can answer that question regardless of which way the decision would be, can't I? That when did I make a decision uh, uh, that I'm going to announce on Sunday night? Uh, only recently, uh, I've held off, actually held off as long as I could, not only in the announcement, but in actually approaching the decision and whether to make it, because I just felt that there were so many things uh, going on that I did not want to uh, put myself in a frame of mind where I might be using political considerations or shading my decisions with uh, political considerations. Uh, I, the only person I talked it over with at all was Nancy because we always do everything together. And uh, it would be, I think, impossible for either one of us to go off on our own, make some decision, and just tell the other one about it after the fact. But uh, she's been a party to uh, all of this and this thinking, and yet, uh, even together, we have uh, many times uh, I just said, well, uh, well, we would talk about it later. Did you have any reservations when it came to making the decision about not seeking another four years here? Well. The decision by waiting, uh, no, the decision then, the things that I have felt were essential to a decision uh, uh, were all known factors by then. I have always said that the people tell you whether you should or should not seek office. And uh, you can't ask them to do that too early. You've got to wait. Uh, a considerable time until you can say that you believe you have a reading uh, from the people. And uh, so that, that is one thing. Uh, then there, there were other considerations, considerations for others that uh, whether you were or were not, there were things that had to be gotten underway, such as a campaign organization. But I felt on that that I could let that go forward without my still having made a decision because uh, there would be such an organization needed to, for some candidate <laughs> in our party. And so that organization started without any word from me as to what the answer would be. I meant by reservations, the longing to go back to California or maybe be able to be a private citizen again or get out from the burden of of this office, there, or was it just a, uh, were there no reservations like that to your decision? Well, there, there would be some mixed emotions about that. Uh, there's no question about my love for California and the, uh, the life that uh, we lead when we're there. But on the other hand, you speak of the burdens, there's, a, there's another thing. There's, uh, a desire to see things through, uh, to not duck and run. Uh, just because the 
the load is heavy. So um, the, the private citizen thing, I guess some of those things, uh, I had already had that experience for eight years in Sacramento with no thought of ever going beyond that, that, um, that I, I'd had, had to deal with all of those things, the private citizen thing or not private citizen before. So uh, that wasn't unusual. It was a familiar experience. <clears throat> there was a lot of published stuff to the effect that Mrs. Reagan was very reluctant to go through another campaign. Can you tell us whether, uh, in effect, she had, you had to persuade her, or was this uh, liberated mutual consent? No, I think that our thinking kind of tracked together that, um, uh, yes, you can, uh, you can dread something or you can, uh, and think back to unpleasant uh, features in, uh, in, the, in previous campaigns and uh, hope against hope that those things won't happen again. But uh, no, as I say, we, uh, we both knew it was a decision that had to be made, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, you, you're either going to have to say you're going home or you're, or you're going to try to stay. And uh, yet we both had the same feeling that, uh, uh, that we didn't talk about it, that we didn't think the time had come yet to talk about it, and that when the time had come, we would, uh, we would have all the information that we needed to know in, in making the decision. But do you remember the date you wrote in your diary, this is it, it's all wrapped up? We were talking about a week ago, 10 days ago. I'm so afraid of leaks. I, I haven't written it in my diary yet. I'll write it Sunday night. You'll have to predate it. <coughs> All right, well, <clears throat> not ducking out on the burden, uh, not cutting and running, as you said. Uh, in a capsule, what would your two or three highest priorities be uh, in, in the second term? The, the, the business you most feel you want to finish? Oh, the economic recovery, which means getting back to a situation in which this government spends within its means, that we have a recovery that isn't like the several that we've had since World War II in which we're off on wrong economic policies that get us into trouble and then we artificially stimulate the economy to get out of that particular trouble but lay the foundation for another recession uh, two or three years down the road, so that we've had eight now since World War II. Um, no, to have what I think we have embarked on, and that is well underway, and that is a sound economy based on sound principles, and to see that through. Then in the international scene, uh, I think that we've made great progress, and I would like to see us continue until there is uh, a feeling that we have peace throughout the world, that we have reduced the danger that is brought about by the excessive armament uh, in the world, that we've actually been able to reduce, not just have agreements that said, well, we won't build them as fast as we used to build them, which is what most of the agreements have been up until now, but to actually disarm and I would hope that going down that path, we could see an end to nuclear weapons that the world would recognize what we tried to achieve in 1946 when we basically were the only ones who had them. And yet we couldn't persuade uh, the Soviet Union to go along with the total elimination of those weapons. Uh, <coughs> that I am uh, vitally interested in having a relationship with our friends and allies below the borders, the southern border, that uh, we've touched upon in times past, but we never have really had the kind of partnership and friendly relation that we as nations here in the Western Hemisphere, uh, who have so many beliefs in common, uh, should have. And this, as you recall, I started very early in the first year that I was here, and uh, I want to carry on with that. I think we've made great progress there. But you could sum it all up in a sound economic 
situation here in our own country with the structural reforms that are needed uh, to put us on the right track, <clears throat> peace in the world, and uh, with that, and maybe we're maybe even bringing it about, would be uh, the sizable reduction in weapons. Uh, Mr. President, turning to the campaign itself, uh, the special interest groups in the Democratic Party seem to be galvanized as never before. Um, it seems to be as much an anti-Reagan movement as a pro-Mondale movement, for example. How do you account for yourself being the lightning rod for so much of this? Well, I think what you're talking about, when you say special interest groups. Organized labor, teacher, uh, women's groups. Well, not all of those, some, some of, of all of those, but I think any time you have a special interest group, uh, they see government only from the vantage point of their particular interest without uh, seeing the, the whole picture and how you can reconcile the interests of one with the interests of all the others uh, in this country. And so when you set out, as we did, to try to make government more efficient, and more economical, and solve the great economic problem that had brought us into the depths of that recession, uh, a Democratic senator, Long, has described it as he said the, the policy is um, uh, don't cut you and don't cut me, cut that fellow behind the tree. Well, uh, we're all the fellows behind the tree if you, if you look at it. And at the same time, since we have elections every two years, and since we have a system in this land that is so unique in which you can have a president of one party and have the, the opposing party hold a majority in one or both houses of the legislature, uh, then it is politics are made. Uh, demagoguery is a common practice. And uh, politics are made out of these things in trying to enlist the people. Now, the truth of the matter is many of these suppose special interest people are uh, crying and they haven't been hurt because we are doing more for uh, the poor and the needy, uh, the handicapped and people of this kind and education than has ever been done before. We think that in many instances in those programs what those special interests have become is a kind of bureaucracy that is no longer looking at the original goal of benefiting their clients who needed help. They now want to make sure that they will always have those clients so that they in that bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy can spread from government to becoming private special interest groups that their own jobs and careers will be safe. For example, let me just put it in the round term of welfare. Shouldn't the intelligent and moral position of government with regard to welfare be that we must have programs aimed at getting people free of welfare to where they are self-sufficient and no longer needing government help? Granted, there will always be some people that through no fault of their own must depend on others uh, for help. But suddenly when you have an organization built up, they don't envision at all being without those clients because then they look and say, where would I be? What would I be do? And so they're, they see, no matter how well-intentioned they are, they see all the problems through that distorted glass of maintaining that clientele where they are. They're their excuse for being. Uh, another campaign related <clears throat> question and that focuses on you, which is that the polls show that an increasing number of people seem to be worried about that the world is less safe than it was when you came into office. I know. And the people are worried that you still might get us into a war somehow. How do you account for 
this attitude toward you personally that still seems to be out there and maybe even on the rise if we're to believe the polls? Well, could I bluntly say that I think that those who for political reasons uh, uh, profit by that misperception about me uh, maybe have more access to uh, media channels than, than we do. Um, it isn't true. We are safer. We are stronger. And peace is more assured today than it has been in recent years. There have been four wars in my lifetime. We never got into one of them because we were too strong. We got into the two major wars because the other people thought we wouldn't fight and that they could do anything to us and they pushed beyond the point in which not out of pride or anything, out of sheer necessity. When you were attacked as we were attacked uh, with an all-out military assault, uh, you're in a war. That was World War II. Uh, Woodrow Wilson held out for four years in the face of all kind of provocations and assaults upon our rights in World War I. And his program was called a program of watchful waiting. And then in the second term, uh, believing that nothing could provoke us to defend ourselves, they did go too far. And we were in World War I. Well, Mr. President, you say that your critics on this subject have more access to the media. Uh, uh, having covered uh, a number of administrations, it seems to me that the President always has maximum access. Everything you say can get on the air, get, in, get into print. Uh, and you have uh, a well-earned reputation of being a very fine communicator. Mm -hmm. uh, those two facts being as they are, uh, I'm just wondering if, if, if there aren't other elements in this business of you being perceived as reckless overseas. I mean, after all, we do have troops in Lebanon who are getting, uh, so, some of whom tragically have been killed, and uh, you have been much tougher than your immediate predecessor, at least, in foreign affairs. Isn't that part of it? Well, what I was trying to point out earlier was that uh, not being strong and not even having the means to be strong, which was true of us so many years in the past, uh, then led to someone taking advantage to the point that whether we wanted it or not, we were in a war. Now, would World War II have occurred if the people of Europe and the people of England had listened to Winston Churchill instead of ignoring him until it was too late? And then they turned to him as the man to help them uh, out of their dilemma. Uh, would World War II have happened if the opposition to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's desire to enhance our armed strength. Had he been heeded with all the things that he was able to accomplish with the legislature that was in both houses was of his party, he was never given the armament that he asked for. Had we been capably armed, would Pearl Harbor ever have happened? We've been told since that war by men on the opposite side, leaders on the op on uh, among our opponents. We've been told since that it was precisely because they saw us not arming and not prepared that they thought they could do that. Now, when I say access to the media, Larry, yes, a president can. But also, Lyndon Johnson once expressed it when a particular senator was, uh, and of his own party, was belittling him and attacking him constantly. And Lyndon said, anyone can get themselves in the news and the press if they attack the president. And it's true. Now, you say, flattering remark about communicator. I've watched the news sometimes on the air on uh, addresses that I've made. And yes, they show me coming into the hall and they show me up there speaking, maybe one sentence aloud is on sound, but then uh, I see myself silently speaking while some commentator goes on for 40 seconds telling the people what he says I said. 
they don't let the people hear what I said. Do you think some of the TV news coverage of your uh, statements uh, is not as full and fair as you'd like to see them? Is that the, a short version of it? Well, I suppose anyone would feel that it's only full and fair if they said if they quoted everything that you said. But um, and no, and I wouldn't, and I don't mean to go that that far, and I wouldn't wouldn't say that. But what I I do believe is that the the drum beat, as we said before, like the special interest groups. So suddenly, uh, a large segment of the population is convinced that. Um, uh, I, I'm a warmonger. Uh, I campaigned on the basis of exactly what I'm trying to do, and that is arms reduction to get the powers of the world together and reduce the number of weapons in the world, not set a limit on how many more we can build, which is what most of the agreements set out to do, reduce them. And I have made it plain here and abroad, and I said it to the Diet and speaking to them in Japan. Uh, I, my goal in my dreams is the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Larry says we only have five minutes left or so, so it's a couple of things we felt were really essential. I, I have a couple of questions on, on your management style here in the, in the office. Um, one is that uh, some observers say that you delegate s so much to the staff sometimes that you're not fully aware of maybe as much as you should be here. And one example of that seems to be the, the original order you signed to apply lie detectors to what would have been your Secretary of State and other members of the NSC. And when that was pointed out to you, you changed that order so it wouldn't necessarily direct a polygraph to those people. Um, and looking back at that example, do you have a sense sometimes that you, you're not as always fully aware no, of things that No, I'm aware that, that there, there may be some details uh, many times that I don't think you can be aware of. And anyone who tries to be uh, is not going to be able to do this job. But the very thing that you mentioned there, here again, the, we were all convinced that the violation of the particular meeting, the secrecy of that meeting, which had to do with national security, that that was a criminal violation. And therefore, when I asked for an investigation by the FBI, that would have been a criminal and was a criminal investigation. Under a criminal investigation, the use of the polygraph uh, is permissible uh, to the law enforcement authorities without my saying yes or no to it. As they progressed with and without ever using the polygraph, as they progressed with the investigation, they themselves came to me and the investigators and said they did not believe that uh, it could be considered a criminal investigation, that our first supposition uh, uh, that the national security had been violated uh, was not substantiated. So therefore, there was no question of anyone using the polygraph, and unless they had said that I could yeah, unless I wanted to order it. But you did originally. No, I, I ordered it only on the basis that, that was part of a criminal investigation. And then this, um, if we're talking about the same investigation, then when they came back to me on that, well, I said, well, no, then. I won't order that if, if this is not a criminal investigation. Well, how about the example of, I, I believe there's a meeting with Senator Nunn and Cohen over the build-down question to be incorporated in the start. And you mentioned to them that, uh, and this was last fall, uh, and you mentioned that you had only recently realized how that the Soviet strategic forces were heavily uh, dependent on heavy land-based missiles and that therefore for no wonder the Soviets would have looked at your original START proposal as being lopsided or maybe unfair. How, how is it that three years into your administration you would just come to that well, bit of information. That was it not seems me like a basic fundamental. No, that was not me alone, uh, and that was all of our negotiators in in discussing this. We'd come to the conclusion that the destabilizing weapon, the thing that has, if there's going to be nightmares for our children that have them, uh, are those missiles that you push the button 
those land-based missiles, and they take off, and 20, 30 minutes later, the world blows up. And therefore, we know that both sides have got bombs that airplanes can drop. We know they've got missiles and submarines, and we have too. What we emphasized were those others because they were the ones push the button and that's it, no calling them back. There's less terror of the conventional craft carrying these missiles, the submarine that must travel out there and can be intercepted, uh, the airplane that can be intercepted, that we're, we're used to airplanes that dropped explosive bombs but that can now drop nuclear weapons. They can also be called back uh, if there is uh, some reason to call them back. So we said that really destabilizing ones, the ones that we should reduce the threat of, are these land-based. And none of us, until the Soviets brought it up, because they're building all these other things too. In fact, they have been building submarines faster than we have. Um, none of us thought that they would introduce, it never occurred to us, uh, a charge that we were trying to dictate their mix of weapons and therefore their strategy. And when we looked at it, and we did, and we realized where we're placing ours in what we call a triad, submarine, air-based, land-based, so that an enemy in trying to have a deterrent to us or an enemy threatening us must have to be able to plan for knocking out three systems, not just one. They, on the other hand, have based their greatest reliance on the land-based. And they brought this up. And when they brought that up, issue up, uh, I looked when it was brought back that they had brought this up and said, well, no, it never had occurred to, to any of us. Uh, we, we always expected that you were, we were going to negotiate all three systems but we were going to start. And we made it plain at the start that we were starting to talk about the land base, but then we'd move on to phase two and, uh, and three with the, with the others. The Soviets did not take to that, took this position that they had the greater number on land and uh, this was a, ta a tactic of theirs and uh, we were trying to change, as I say, their strategy. And uh, I said, well, then let's, let's change. If that's the way they want to do it, then uh, we're not trying to change their strategy. But was it a staff failing or your misunderstanding in the first place? You didn't know no, that, that, I don't that think information had been out there for even years before you came in that, that they were heavily dependent on... It had never really, been, it never really been pointed up. All we knew was that, you know, it's harder to know how many bombs they're making. They're, they've continued to make more airplanes than we have. They continue to have more bombers than we have. And we know they were building submarines faster than we were. So it never occurred to us that um, just the fact that they were further ahead in their strategic land-based weapons than they were in these other uh, uh, phases, that uh, this was a, a planned strategy that they intended to hold to. And I'm, maybe it still isn't because they're still building those other things as fast as they can. Uh, so when they made that an issue, well then we immediately proved that we were flexible. We said, well if that's an issue that, in other words, they do not want to take the land-based as the first negotiating position and then the others later, okay, then we'll, we'll take them all up. We'll take the total number of weapons up and negotiate on that basis. No, I don't think that was a case of lacking a, a, a knowledge of details. I, I don't think that, I never heard anyone uh, of our negotiators or any of our military people or anyone else bring up that particular point. Maybe we should uh, wind this up on a philosophical note or reflective note as you contemplate. Could I, before you get into it though, could I go back to your previous question, previous to this one uh, on the matter? You mentioned Lebanon and our Marines in Lebanon in keeping with your question on uh, whether I'm warlike or using force more. Remember that the multinational force was there at the request of the government of Lebanon as an aid in peacemaking. It was a part of our overall peace proposal for the Middle East where we hoped that we could bring the Arab states and Israel together to do as Egypt and Israel had done and continue the Camp David peace process. And the 
roof blew off in Lebanon with uh, the Israelis crossing the border, admittedly in their own defense because of the terrorist attacks that had been made across their borders, their northern border, with the Syrians also in there, with the rival factions internally that had been uh, fighting a kind of civil war within the country for several years. And this was all aimed at getting the foreign forces to withdraw and standing by while Lebanon, which hadn't really had a government for several years, reinstated its sovereignty and its ability to protect itself. And so we were part of a multinational force that was there not for combat purposes, but to offer some stability. And for the better part of a year, practically a year, this, this is what it was and how it worked. And it was only as they began to make progress, scheduled meetings in Geneva and so forth, last August, that the terrorist attacks began against the multinational force. They can force us to withdraw from what we think is a legitimate peacemaking function. So now, go ahead with your next question. Well, as you contemplate <clears throat> certainly the strong possibility of another five years <clears throat> here, counting the last year of this term, uh, what are your reflections about the job? What does it do to you as a man? Uh, is there a danger of being cut off from the real world? If you had a magic time machine that you could go back for a few decades, is there anything different you would do to prepare yourself for this job? <laughs> well, there might be something of that kind. A, a, because believe me, I never in my wildest dra dreams ever aspired to public uh, service. Uh, I loved the world that I was in, the, uh, the entertainment world. I did always believe that you had to pay your way, so the very fact that I'd been blessed with some success and uh, could attract an audience and so forth. I thought that it was only right that I should use that in behalf of causes that I believed in, so I used to campaign for others. But I never, never entered my mind that I wanted to hold public office. I didn't want, want to. Matter of fact, I was the most reluctant candidate in the world to, when finally I was persuaded to seek the governorship and, uh, and did. I have to say, however, that after it happened and uh, Nancy and I were both very reluctant, thought that we were going into a life that we would not like at all. We found after several months that it was probably the most fulfilling and exciting thing we'd, we'd ever done. So I don't know what, what I could have done or would have done uh, differently. In fact, I'm not sure that people really do plan uh, or should plan to go into uh, public office. Maybe it's better to uh, simply achieve something in what you're doing out there and your neighbors tell you whether <laughs> you should uh, uh, serve them by way of public office. Has the experience changed any of your views that you held when you came in as you, as you watch the world work now from this perspective? No, not really because of that eight years as governor of the largest state in the Union. Um, I think there, 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 in other words, there weren't too many surprises here. There were some, but they, were, uh, they weren't the kind of surprise of, of having to change your thinking or anything. They were surprises of some of the requirements, uh, such as finding that you can't go a half an hour away from the uh, White House, uh, uh, like saying going out for an evening or something, without having a phone system established so that you were still wherever you are, are in instant communications if need be with the world. That was hard to get used to. And you, uh, hard to get used to that, uh, like a State of the Union address, that there is, uh, if there is believed to be a security threat to a place where you are and other members of the government are going to be there, including those people who are in the line of succession if anything happens, to you that one of the line of succession must not go and attend that meeting. Sam Pierce? Huh? Sam Pierce? Uh, no, Sam was out of the country, so he didn't count. <laughs> there had to be another count, a cabinet Who member. Who was out? Uh, uh, I don't know whether we're, I'm supposed to tell which one didn't go, but just say, let me just say one cabinet member was notified that 
he was here in the city, he could not attend the, that particular affair. How about on foreign policy, though? The, the governorship really didn't prepare you so much for, for that. Were, have there been things that have happened there that have changed your views? Um, well, let me, let me just put on that on foreign, foreign policy. No, you don't have a foreign policy as a governor. And yet you find yourself, if it's a state like California, uh, there on the rim of the Pacific, you find that you do have uh, much more contact uh, with foreign government just because of, of the interest of your own state. For example, California, if it were a nation, would be the, uh, well, when I was governor, it was the seventh. Some have said now that it's changed, it would be the eighth. Would be the seventh ranking, at that time, would have been the seventh ranking economic power in the world. Uh, we are, are the exit and entrance point for a tremendous percentage of all of our world commerce. So you were a little exposed to foreign relations. But beyond that, myself personally, uh, I'd been on the mashed potato circuit uh, since I didn't sing or dance when anyone asked me to make a personal appearance in the business that I was in before, it was to be a speaker. And I always, I never made a canned speech, I always thought that I'd wanted to speak in things that interested me. And I was interested in foreign affairs. And as a matter of fact, at one time, running for governor the first time, uh, there were some members of your trade who wrote that if I didn't stop talking about world affairs, uh, uh, I couldn't be elected governor, that uh, I should begin interesting myself in the domestic problems of the state. I thought it was a little unfair. I wasn't talking that much about it. But it was true that my interests were in that, that line. And uh, so that wasn't so much of a shock or a switch when I got here. It was, I did find, I had underestimated how much of your time uh, would be devoted to that. Uh, my main interest was in trying to get the economy going again and so forth, and uh, uh, I have been surprised by the extent to which uh, your day, every day, is involved with uh, world affairs. But you well, you'd ask something else there just before about... Uh, well, <coughs> I had asked what it does to you as a man, and do you oh. feel that there's a danger of being cut off from the real world? No, that I wanted to answer, because I know there are many people that say that and try to portray the presidency as that you're isolated in such a way that you, uh, you know, don't have any contact with human beings and you don't know what people are thinking about. I have never felt that once. Uh, first of all, uh, I see an awful lot of my mail, uh, but all the previous years before getting here, I still know all those people. And I don't mean just close friends, but the kids I went to school with, the people in my hometown, uh, the people I knew in Hollywood, and I don't just mean m movie stars, I mean the people in the studios, the crews, the fellows that you worked with. Uh, you. I still feel a contact with all of them, but also there's another thing in this job. Uh, you're surrounded by people, and uh, not just cabinet members or ambassadors. Uh, you're, you're surrounded with all the people that work here, uh, the people that uh, do the things in the White House with the, the security people and all. You get to know them. You, you get to know about their families and what their problems are, too. And uh, then, of course, no matter what security does, and granted that you can't ride in an open car anymore, uh, um, or go down and walk out into a strange and unchecked crowd, uh, but you still have a contact uh, when you go any place to, to speak, like yesterday in Atlanta, you still meet a number of those people, and they're pretty representative of the whole group. And uh, I have never, I've never felt uh, that estrangement. What you do feel is a personal loss. You find yourself remembering what it was like when on the spur of the moment you could just uh, 
uh, yell to your wife that you were going down to the drugstore and get a magazine and, uh, and you can't do that anymore. Uh, things of that kind. I've often told, I've made up a joke and told about that uh, the first week after I left the governor's office, uh, I've told it as if it were true. I've said that Nancy and I, uh, and we were going out one evening and we went out and both of us got in the back seat of the car and waited for somebody to drive us. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, yeah. thank you. All right. We appreciate it. Thanks okay, a lot. you bet. Oops.